Mesdames et Messieurs les ministres, Mesdames et Messieurs les ambassadrices, ambassadeurs, Mesdames et Messieurs, je suis très heureux, Monsieur le Premier ministre, de vous retrouver ici et de nous retrouver ici rassemblés à l'Elysée pour ce sommet bilatéral franco-britannique, le 36e dans ce format. Et je veux vous remercier ainsi que vos ministres pour le travail fait avec l'ensemble des équipes pour parvenir à la déclaration commune robuste et aussi pour les très bons échanges que nous avons eus durant la matinée et à l'instant avec nos ministres. Cinq ans se sont écoulés depuis la dernière rencontre entre nos deux gouvernements. Durant ces cinq années, nos sociétés ont traversé la pandémie de Covid-19. Elles connaissent le retour de la guerre sur notre continent. Elles vivent une crise énergétique et le retour de l'inflation. Et durant ces cinq années aussi, le Royaume-Uni a quitté l'Union européenne. Le 18 janvier 2018, à Sandhurst, je rappelais qu'il y a deux choses que rien ne peut changer. Aucun vote, aucune décision politique, et j'ajouterai aussi maintenant aucune pandémie. C'est notre histoire et notre géographie. Et celle-ci nous place ensemble face à un destin commun, et c'est encore pour ça aujourd'hui. Nous avons une histoire qui nous lie, nous avons des valeurs qui nous soudent de nos solidarités, nous avons une amitié dans nos peuples parfois connaît une parenthèse sur un terrain de football ou un terrain de rugby. Je ne veux ici pas aller plus loin dans les mentions sportives compte tenu de ce qui nous attend dans les prochains temps. Et nous avons do have a geography that binds us lastly and that's why um, today this summit is indeed exceptional. It's a moment uh, clearly I would say of a reunion of reconnection and of a new beginning. It marks a shared will to speak to one another, to better coordinate and build together new prospects in this context. And I believe that the uh, will that you clearly expressed and that we discussed uh, jointly together and what our governments have worked on, what we manage to uh, create the meetings with the, our business uh, leaders and the young leaders goes in that direction. The common purpose that appeared to us as self-evident in the new uh, European and international context that we're seeing, placing Europe faced with new responsibility, both of us uh, permanent members of the UN Security Council, uh, NATO members equipped uh, powers with shared interests. We want to work together and build concrete solutions for our future. In this respect and in this context, I'd like to welcome uh, the new uh, turn that was taken and your uh, resolve to re-engage with the EU and congratulate you for the uh, Windsor framework that was uh, concluded with uh, President van der Leyen. Now, this uh, new beginning, we'd of course like to continue and take full advantage of it to coordinate more. The Prime Minister Netanyahu the necessity of a new nuovo incontro uh, intergovernativo tra Italia e Israele, non se ne viene uno dal 2013, il prossimo dovrebbe svolgersi in Israele e vorremmo um, organizzarlo quanto prima. Globally, we've decided on concrete action together on the training of um, Ukrainian military and high-value segments, and together we want to prepare the coming weeks and months with a shared conviction is that we'll have to find an outcome to this uh, conflict. We must place our Ukrainian friends in the best possible situation so they choose the moment of the and the terms of the discussions that will have to be led. In the way we lead the operation, there's this result to build a lasting and acceptable peace in line with international law and the interests of the Ukrainian people. A year to the day in Versailles, there was a major European Council where we were defining the terms of European strategic autonomy and during which we affirmed that Ukraine belonged to the Euro U European family. This strategic autonomy is also forge through a heightened need to uh, build uh, renewed ties with your countries. In terms of security and defense, uh, we've discussed at length here how to bolster over and above the Russian um, aggression in Ukraine the con to strengthen our shared capabilities to work more on 
interoperability, operational, technical, and human, I'm thinking in particular of our resolve to work ambitiously on the future anti-ship uh, missile, the future cruise missile, interoperability of our uh, future systems and in uh, areas as different as um, mastery of uh, the seabed or energy directed weapons and so the strengthening of these capabilities is key and it's also that that we wish to build to think also the terms of tomorrow's European security to have a genuine legal framework and capabilities for our anti-missile protection and to build what will happen after the decisions taken on you start you'll have understood our commitment is to work now for our continent in order to <clears throat> develop a common strategy to strengthen our cooperation do that in areas that are absolutely key for our countries i'll just cite a few energy cooperation in this regard this um, cooperation wasn't impacted by Brexit. It's bilateral. It's strong. It's the fruit of profound choices that you made of complementarity between models nuclear with Hinckley Pointy and the most visible operationalization of cooperation in the sector. Size will see that we support fully, which will be an opportunity for new economic dynamism and uh, the result to continue this shared uh, projects in civilian nuclear power and to strengthen our projects and cross investments. We saw that once more this morning in terms of renewable energy. You have um, expertise uh, and capabilities that are significant, offshore wind notably, and to have coordination in our low carbon hydrogen strategy. I believe I can say that our interests converge fully. Same commitment on the environmental front with a shared ambition, accelerate our exit from fossil fuels, but also <coughs> reform our international financial architecture support against the fight of climate change preparing the results of the summit to be held in Paris on the 23rd of June on the new financial pact, strengthen our joint commitments on defending biodiversity and this through the various milestones in the year, the end of year COP to finalize um, joint uh, achievements and in the fight against um, illegal immigration we wish to uh, make uh, progress in lockstep. We're faced, aware of the human issues and the extreme sensitivity of these issues. Together we're already acting and I'd like to thank here both our ministers and all the teams who are working closely together. In 22 it's over um, 30,000 um, small boat crossings that we prevented. We've dismantled 55 networks of organized crime and made 500 arrests thanks to the work of the joint Franco-British um, intelligence cell. Last October, we agreed on a renewed ambitious bilateral framework to continue to fight against illegal immigration. Today, we've decided to continue in that direction very operationally, concretely, and conscious of the shared nature of our responsibility. And in this re respect, what we've decided is um, heightened coordination on our activities, new initiatives compels um, each of us, and we must act together in a fully shared framework, but also to be able to do this with all the Europeans who are uh, concerned by uh, the transit and crossings and with um, some countries uh, from which the traffic is organized. And in this regard, the Calais group, that's a relevant forum for coordination, and both our ministers are working closely on that, and they'll be holding forthcoming meetings on that. But we'd also like to engage several countries of origin involved in the illegal trafficking networks. We've agreed on the need to heighten our intervention and surveillance capabilities, and we've um, also decided to strengthen multi-year funding to commit uh, sums commensurate with the current need on both sides. And lastly, all the cooperation we've discussed today 
would be of uh, not much use without concrete actions to strengthen ties between civil societies. We met with British and French businesses that are invested in decarbonisation issues. We're able to announce very tangible projects and demonstrate through example this complementarity, this resolve to move forward together. We also met with young Franco-British uh, talents looking very promising, and they will be the players of our Entente Cordiale. It was vital that they should be part and parcel of this summit, and it's in that same spirit that we've committed to greater cooperation between our museum, our young, our athletes, our schools, notably with a commitment to facilitate school trips between our two uh, countries. Those are some of the issues of this 36th Franco-British summit, but you'll have understood that it wasn't a summit like just any other, and that given what has happened these past few years and that the time the planet and the continent are living through, it's a summit of a renewed ambition and before even more ambitious concrete achievements. Thank you, Prime Minister, for being in Paris today. Mr. Le Président, Emmanuel. Thank you for hosting us here today. Now, if we're honest, the relationship between our two countries has had its challenges in recent years. And I'm not just referring to France knocking England out of the World Cup, but I believe today's meeting does mark a new beginning. An entente renewed. We are looking to the future, a future that builds on all that we share, our history, our geography, our values, and a future that is far more ambitious about how we work together to improve the lives of the people that we serve. We've discussed every aspect of our crucial alliance today and made important progress in three areas in particular, illegal migration, energy, and security. Emmanuel and I share the same belief. Criminal gangs should not get to decide who comes to our countries. Within weeks of my coming into office, we agreed our largest ever small boats deal. And today, we've taken our cooperation to an unprecedented level to tackle this shared challenge. We're announcing a new detention center in northern France, a new command center bringing our enforcement teams together in one place for the first time, and an extra 500 new officers patrolling French beaches, all underpinned by more drones and other surveillance technologies that will help ramp up the interception rate. And the legislation the UK has introduced this week supports this because it's designed to break the business model of the criminal gangs and remove the pull factors, bringing them to the Channel Coast. Now, we will always comply with our international treaty obligations, but I am convinced that within them that we can do what is necessary to solve this shared problem and stop the boats. Second, the UK and France are working together so that never again can the likes of Putin weaponize our energy security. You are helping us to secure our supply of nuclear power thanks to EDF's incredible work at Sizewell Sea. And through our ports and interconnectors, we can be Europe's gateway for non-Russian gas. But today we are going even further with an ambitious new energy partnership. We've signed a new deal on civil nuclear cooperation, agreed that France will examine the case for new energy interconnectors and committed to work together on low carbon energy. Together, I believe we are creating a future where every watt of energy powering our homes and industry will come from secure, sustainable and reliable sources. Third, the UK and France share a special bond and a special responsibility. When the security of our continent is threatened, we will always be at the forefront of its defense. And today, we're going even further to strengthen our security and defense cooperation. We've agreed to train Ukrainian Marines, helping to give Ukraine a decisive advantage on the battlefield and for Ukraine to win this war, to increase the interoperability of our forces, harnessing the full potential of the combined Joint Expeditionary Force to promote security and stability in the Indo-Pacific, coordinating our carrier deployments, and we will jointly explore the development of complex weapons 
like air defense, combat air, and long-range weapons. Now, for decades, we've been two of the world's biggest defense powers and leading contributors to NATO, and we will continue to stand together for freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. Finally, today there has also been a celebration of the richness of our cultures, all that we give to each other and all that we learn from each other. So we've agreed to make it easier for our children to go on school exchanges and our museum creators, writers and artists to create and collaborate together. And that brings me to my concluding thought, that for all the agreements that we've reached today, in the end, it's about people, the bonds of family, friendship and solidarity that we share. And there's no greater example of that human connection than the sympathy of the French people on the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. And I want to thank you personally, Emmanuel, for the graciousness of your words. They said everything about you as a leader and as a friend of Britain. You know, I've learned very quickly in this job that there are some things you can control and some things that you can't. And one thing that you can't control is who you get as an international counterpart. I feel very fortunate to be serving alongside you and incredibly excited about the future that we can build together. Merci, mon ami. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, Prime Minister. We're now going to move on to the questions of the journalists. Thank you. Chris Mason from BBC News. The same question to you both, if I may. Do you think you'll ever be able to arrange a deal where migrants leaving France for the UK are returned to France? Thank you. Yeah, I'll take that. Thanks, uh, Chris. I think what you've seen today is an unprecedented level of cooperation on tackling this shared challenge, because that's what it is. It's a shared challenge. It's not just the UK that's grappling with illegal migration. It's not just France. It's countries across Europe. And now our partnership is incredibly strong. I think the work that our two Home Secretary, Suella and Gerard, have done over the past few months uh, has been unlike anything that anyone's ever seen. And you're seeing the fruits of that cooperation today with a new agreement, new investment, uh, and that will help both of us stop the cycle of these criminal gangs. Um, and going forward, there will be more that we can do. We started that last November, we've built on it today, and we'll continue cooperating. As, as the President said, and he'll probably talk about, the Calais Group is another important forum for these conversations to happen with other Northern European countries. And I'm sure Emmanuel probably will talk a little bit about the EPC. And as we think about future cooperation between the UK and other countries in Europe, what the President has set up is a new forum for that engagement to happen and illegal migration I'm certain will be one of the topics that we will discuss when we come to that meeting that we'll be pleased to host next year uh, in the UK and obviously is happening this year elsewhere. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, first, I think we focus on what we have to do on the short run to prevent precisely these migrations and to try to dismantle all these, uh, these groups, these networks and these models. And, and I think the level of ambition of this new plan is exactly what we need. This is what we can do on the, at the bilateral level. Second, this is not an agreement between UK and France, but an agreement between UK and the EU, because Dublin agreements are no more uh, in a situation to be implemented. So this is something now to be negotiated. Third, as uh, Mr. Prime Minister just further said, uh, we do believe that the right way to approach this migration is a, a broader space. Western Balkans, European Union, and not just France, and UK have to work closely together in order precisely to dismantle these groups and to be more efficient regarding this phenomenon. And this is why it's part of the key topics we have to discuss in the framework of this uh, European political community. And um, our perspective is to have concrete discussion in June in uh, Kisinau, in Moldova, and uh, indeed, next semester we will have in Spain, and the semester after in the uh, UK. So we want to follow up. Question suivante pour la partie.
following question on the French side. Good morning, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Prime Minister, Agence France Press. Kremlin said there's a foreign hand and a Western hand behind the protest movement in Georgia recently. What is your response to this? And in return, do you see the hand of Vladimir Putin in the draft government law that Georgia has finally withdrawn? And if I may, on Ukraine, you spoke about the conditions to be created for a future peace. Are you on the same wavelength when it comes to the necessity of a negotiation? Mr. Sunak, do you share this uh, idea of uh, the President? Yeah, on your first question, there's a tendency that isn't uh, new in the Kremlin, which is to consider that any population movement is manipulation coming from outside because the deep conviction is that, in fact, there's no public opinion or no free people. We are entitled as an old democracy to believe the opposite. And so I won't describe what has happened, but we mustn't lapse into that rather summary explanation. However, Georgia today is um, affected by worrisome uh, movements, and we saw um, images these past few days worrying um, a young woman carrying the um, European flag who was uh, uh, pushed around, uh, to put it mildly, and that uh, cannot leave us indifferent uh, as both of us, as Europeans. Our resolve is to assist uh, Europe public opinions as uh, freely as possible to express their views and countries to conduct uh, in a sovereign fashion, the course of their existence. Georgia is subject to very strong pressure, and I hope it can find the path to greater calmness, which is uh, compatible with the European prospect that we held out to it. I would add also in this regard that the uh, uh, that peacemaking initiatives be taken by the government. Former political leaders held um, in poor health should be released so that we can uh, take into account their state of health and that uh, the situation is, uh, becomes calmer in regard to uh, tensions. We'll return to that in the coming weeks. Uh, for Ukraine, short term, our goal is to um, help Ukraine conduct the counteroffensive that it wishes to conduct the priority as military. I've always said for my part that our prospect was indeed that there should be a lasting pill built, forged in um, conditions that um, Ukraine will choose, and our duty is to place it in that situation. Thanks. And I think I agree with Emmanuel, so let me just be unequivocal about this. We want Ukraine to win this war. And we're absolutely united in that. And right now, that means providing them with the support and the capabilities and the training in order to mount a counteroffensive and have decisive advantage on the battlefield. And that's what you've seen from the UK, from France, from other allies, whether it's through the provision of main battle tanks, longer range weapons, as we've announced today, training of Marines. These are all things that will help Ukraine win this war, gain that advantage on the battlefield, mount a successful counteroffensive. And that's what we are channeling all our energies towards. And with regard to the future, I, think I agree with what Emmanuel just said there. Ultimately, that is a decision for Ukraine to make. It's not a decision for us to make for them. Our job is to put Ukraine in the strongest possible position. And that is what our conversations today have been about. That's what our defense ministers spend an enormous amount of time coordinating. And I think actually the, the announcements that you've seen from us today around training Marines, helping with the provision of ammunition are very tangible examples of our commitment to deliver Ukraine that advantage, and that is where all our focus is going to be over the coming weeks and months. Question suivante. Following question for the British press. Uh, Oliver Wright from The Times. Prime Minister, um, the UK has already spent around £300 million supporting French efforts to stem small boats, but the boats have kept coming. Uh, the UK is now promising around £500 million more. Um, what makes you think that this money will be any more effective? Um, President Macron, if I may, um, do you think Britain and France can ever be as close as they were before Brexit? I'll, I'll take, Ollie, I'll take your first one. I think just a couple of things. It, I think you described it as, as French efforts. Let's just be clear. These are joint efforts. 
right? That's the first thing to recognize. These are efforts by our teams jointly on the ground to tackle what is a shared challenge. Uh, and that's the first thing to get across. So now you talked in terms about our previous investment. And actually, Emmanuel mentioned it in his remarks, right? 50 different criminal gangs broken, almost 500 arrests made. And just this year, thousands of boats stopped. Right, that is, that is the result of a partnership that is working and is delivering. Now, is the situation still challenging? Of course it is, right? And that's because there is a global migration problem that we are seeing the impact of on our shores and across Europe. And as we saw recently, tragically, people dying off the coast of Italy. Now, there are global forces at play, but we are working incredibly hard to try and break that cycle. And I think the cooperation that we've had, and especially since last November, has really made a difference. And the announcements that we've made today will make an even bigger difference going forward. And I've always been clear, there's no one solution to solving this very complicated problem, and nor will it be solved overnight. Right? But there's, you know, our new legislation will help, and I've always said cooperation with our allies, especially France, is an important part of that. Um, but where we can make investments alongside Emmanuel and, and France, we're not doing this alone, we're jointly investing in all these operations, uh, or indeed upstream to disrupt criminal crime uh, gangs, whether it's in the Balkans or elsewhere, those are good investments for the UK mm -hmm. to make if they stop people coming and, and reduce the pressure on our asylum system in our hotels. Um, and I actually think you know, today's agreements represent a very positive step forward, uh, and the level of cooperation and integration is going to make a difference, and I think we are confident, our teams are confident, that you're going to see the benefit of that on the ground, um, and that's what we're going to deliver. Look, uh, this is my wish, but it depends on what we will do in the coming months and years. Um, on the short run, what we have to do is to fix the consequences of the Brexit. A lot of issues we have are direct consequences of the Brexit, and probably some of these consequences were underestimated, but we have to fix them. Second, we have to deal with the consequences of this war and the new geopolitical context. But what we want to do is now to build new partnerships on defense and security, facing the war, regarding climate change, in order to better coordinate our international um, activity. And for our businesses and our people, we want to build new links, new relations. And uh, indeed, this European political community is one of those frameworks. I think this is a very relevant political framework to build something new at the level of the continent. My wish definitely, because it's, it makes sense with our history, our geography, our DNA, I would say, is to have the best, I mean, the best possible relation and the closest alliance. But it will depend on our commitment, our willingness, but I'm sure we will do it. Et dernière question pour la presse française. Last question for the French press. Good morning, Prime Minister. Good morning, uh, Mr. President, BFM TV. Both your countries are confronted to important social movements. Have you together spoken about this question uh, related to inflation? Did you evoke this question and the mechanism to fight inflation? And Mr. Macron, the reform of the retirement uh, you've said in a letter to the trade unions today that the MPs represent the plurality of the opinions in our country. If your project doesn't receive the majority amongst the members of parliament, would you exclude to pass it through force and use Article 49.3 for the reform that you're seeking? Thank you for that question. The situation that our countries are experiencing creates a lot of difficulty for many of our fellow citizens. Inflation, energy, food prices, um, cost of living, creating very challenging situations in um, all European countries for our fellow citizens. And that's why, for that matter, since uh, the autumn of 2021, we have a a uh, resolute policy of support on energy prices and now on food prices by uh, covering a great many of the uh, spending items for the uh, those with financial difficulties and pushing um, authorities to assume their difficulties with them. Um, organizing uh, agreements with retailers, the strong vigilance, strong commitment. Look at the figures of uh, France with our 
appears we remain uh, one of the countries with the lowest inflation rate because of the policies was imp implemented. There were demonstrations uh, as part of the pensions uh, reform. I won't uh, engage in any fictional politics here. It's not my role. Uh, there was a time for union negotiation. Then was a, a time during which the executive work, and then there's the parliamentary uh, time uh, at the uh, House and the Senate. The Senate is working flat out both day and night to uh, review the bill. We must uh, respect that parliamentary time without um, in any way uh, crafting any uh, possible scenarios of, of fiction of whatever sort. I'll let the senators work with the government, and it, then the parliament will follow the terms of our constitution so that the legislation process can be completed, neither more nor less, and that in a climate of calm, of respect for agreements, disagreements, and a sense of responsibility in the current context. I think when you, when you talk about inflation and, and the cost of living, the biggest driver of that inflation is energy prices. Right? It's because we've had a, a war that has weaponized energy supplies, and all of our citizens are paying the price for that. And actually, that's one of the very practical, tangible things to come out of today's summit, is that cooperation between our two countries and our businesses on improving our energy security and accelerating the transition to renewable, nuclear, and more secure energy supplies. Now, I, I'm, I'm more confident that we can make that happen as a result of today's summit because of the partnership between our researchers, our businesses, our governments. We are going to be able to get our citizens cheaper, more secure, more renewable, and cleaner energy faster. Uh, and that's what people should come away from this, seeing that actually these things can make a big difference for the citizens that we're both very privileged to represent. We want to ease the pressures on cost of living for them. The way to do that is to diversify and improve our supply of energy and accelerate that transition to net zero. And we've made good progress on that goal um, today. And maybe that, you know, that's a thought that I can close on. A little bit it goes to the previous question. You know, that's a tangible example of the relationship that we have. And you can see that today in the comprehensive nature of the discussions, the breadth of the discussions, the depth of the discussions, the fact that we've both got our senior teams all here today talking through these issues. Um, you know, I, I always say we left the EU, but we didn't leave Europe. And you know, Emmanuel said previously, you know, Brexit didn't change geography. Right? We, we want to have a close, cooperative, collaborative relationship with our European partners and allies. And of course, that starts with our nearest neighbor, France. And today is the first step on that journey. We're writing a new chapter in this relationship. And I'm really looking forward to everything that we can build on in the coming months and years ahead. Come to the end of this press conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.